Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Hey. Taisha Tyler. The Tribe Called Quest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz. Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Ow! Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. On this week's episode, we've got two veterans of 90s rock who went on to form bands that referenced air travel in their names and whose biggest bands both start with Jaw. Blake Schwarzenbach of Jawbreaker and Jay Robbins of Jawbox. Sorry if that's a little confusing. I'll clear it up for you. Schwarzenbach was and is the singer and guitarist of the band Jawbreaker, which had its initial run from 1986 until 1996, at which time they acrimoniously splintered after longtime fans turned their backs on 1995's Dear You, mostly because these dogmatic listeners were mad that the band had signed to a major label. These things were a big deal then, which seems kind of quaint now. But history was incredibly kind to both Jawbreaker and Dear You, so much so that in 2017 they reformed to headline Chicago's massive Riot Fest, and they've been playing together pretty much ever since. In the intervening years, Schwarzenbach also played in other great bands, most notably Jets to Brazil, which is what I was referencing earlier. Does it make sense now? Jawbreaker's on tour now, and they're bringing along some of their favorite bands to open, which brings us to Jawbox, which followed a sort of similar trajectory to Jawbreaker. They came together in the late 80s, released a couple of incredible albums for a respected independent label, and then moved on to the big leagues with all the baggage and joy that might bring. Jawbox split in 1997, and Robbins went on to form Burning Airlines. Do you see that pattern? But Jawbox reconvened in 2019. Those two bands certainly aren't the beginning and end of Robbins' amazing contributions to the world of music, though. Prior to Jawbox, he was in Government Issue. You'll hear them referred to as GI in this chat. And he served as producer for a number of bands over the years, including Jetster Brazil, The Promise Ring, The Dismemberment Plan, Against Me, and other bands that make my 1990s heart sing. I hope you'll notice I haven't said emo once. In this conversation, Jay and Blake talk about what it feels like to play shows together again after all these years and all this pandemic. Blake compliments Jay on his psychedelic guitar playing, and Jay isn't sure what to make of that. And we learn, I think for the first time, that Jawbox briefly considered calling themselves Jawbreaker before Jay discovered Jawbreaker's first single at a record store and crossed it off the list. Enjoy. Can you believe that I'm still in the Tenderloin? Where are you? What is that place? We're at the Phoenix Hotel. And what, is that your room? <laughs> it is. Oh. Aren't you supposed to be in Sacramento? Uh, no, we were there on Sunday. Oh. We're going to L.A. tomorrow, but we, we had like kind of a, a layover here. Oh, wicked. Did you go to Brenda's French Soul Food? A couple of the people did, yeah. I have not been. That's a good place. But maybe not a great place if you're trying to like stay sort of in fighting trim on tour. That's not a place to go eat a lot of breakfasts because it'll clobber you. Right. No, I'm just doing intravenous drugs out on Eddy Street. <laughs> All right, well, good. You're in, you're in the right spot. <laughs> exactly. And this is bizarre that we're going to have a longer conversation now than we had in the... <laughs> <laughs> the whole week of tour. We're having a longer conversation from much, much further away yeah. than when we were face to face and you talked to me about Killing Joke and I couldn't say anything because you knew more. Well, I didn't give you a chance to say anything because I couldn't shut up because I'm that kind of... Just lording your expertise <laughs> as always, Jay. I'm sharing the bounty of my sad <laughs> knowledge, but <laughs> there's like certain things that I get like where I'm like, no, I'm the saddest fan, and I'll prove it to you now. But I'm just sharing things that are exciting to me, you know? Sure. Well, that's kind of a lovely byproduct of the pandemic, I think, that like we, you know, throw up all our favorite data at our friends <laughs> when we see them. We catch them out on the street. And you're like, oh my God, you haven't watched this. Right. Did you know? Because I've been looking at YouTube <laughs> for 648 hours and I can tell you some things. Also, because I know you're also a Killing Joke fan. And I was pleased to discover that Ben is also a Killing Joke fan. Yeah. When I left the bus just now, there was a fierce argument between Hayes and Ben about Golden Brown and the Stranglers. What What was the substance of that argument? I mean, there's no argument. That song's amazing. Well, that didn't seem to be in dispute, but Hayes was attempting to claim that it was their best song, while Ben said that it was barely even representative of the greatness of the group's catalog. <laughs> and like, I had to get out of Got there. Got out of there in the nick of time. Seriously, I was like, ah, oh, guys, Zoom call coming up. Got to look. There may just be like a blood strewn Dan in the bus. <laughs> <get back. laughs> just teeth everywhere. And you just, yeah. Well, 
I mean, Golden Brown's a pretty great tune. It's pretty like if you think about it, what other song do you know of that is that's an international hit song on and off for decades, and it's mostly just harpsichord and vocals in a weird meter? It channels some kind of like left bank savoir faire. Yeah. You know, there's this like Euro affectation to it that's so beautiful. And I think it really charms people. It seems like a song made to be in films. Yeah. You know, and those kind of existentially indifferent like french romantic triangle dramas from the <laughs> 70s <laughs> just like one lover's entrails roasting on the side of the same and that song like gently playing gently <laughs> roasting as the song gently plays yes yeah <laughs> i have that same kind of fandom where i'm like it's just all great at this point it's all great so even the lowliest, the worst misstep is still magical to me, you know. But Stranglers are that kind of band for me, too. Killing Joke and Stranglers. Yeah. It's nice to have a, a relationship with an artist like that. Like where, I mean, it's an overused phrase, but like where you make them your hill to die on. Yeah. You know, I, I do that for a few that uh, some say is indefensible. What's your most indefensible fandom? I'll tell you, uh, it's no secret. It's Third Eye Blind. I'd hardly say that's indefensible. <laughs> this depends who you're talking to, I guess. But, yeah, I don't mind taking stick for it. Like it's, I expect that they're 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 kind of awful in some ways. Uh, I think there might be some personality issues there. It's megalomaniacal. I, you know, I think I listen to them a lot, and I was thinking today actually because I thought, hey, I'll listen to them in their hometown, walking through the drug littered streets. Like seemed really appropriate, and I think that they were for better or worse like incredibly canny about anticipating what became millennial pop like that kind of i'm sure you live live in terror in this culture of music but like that kind of imaginary island music that people started making in the 2000s <laughs> <laughs> like with the Whoa! Oh yeah, the whoa was kind of... like very like weird, like little discreet. Boil down a hook to its like, what is a hook? Like, oh, here it's a little nugget that is going to like lodge in your brain and do your worst. You you can't extract it. That kind of thing. And they're like real, yeah. real uh, little slick kind of yeah. When it, what's what's the word I'm thinking of? Thinking of the word like Lego, <laughs> like little Lego bits that make a song. I think you as an engineer would understand more of the mechanical aspects of it like recently you described something to me is just imagining it as cut and paste cut and paste cut oh and paste. yeah totally being a like assembly yeah you know the assembly line nature of how those songs are built in my mind i experience it as like this imaginary disney film like a jungle book or something uh -huh. with this kind of vague ethnic imaginary of like an island people singing in in celebration like on a beach right yeah that that grabs this mass listenership of like wow it's like i'm on an island doing molly and you know <laughs> all my friends are there and there's no adults <laughs> whatever that is whatever whatever katie perry and all that shit is but third eye blind like they did that right they paved the way they kind of did it's all over their music and it's so weird well, they couldn't have known what was coming. No, and they didn't get to taste in the sweet fruit of success <laughs> at the back end. I mean, they got it up front, but like, really, they should be getting a little kickback from some of these newcomers. You know that I'll, I'll hit you with I'll hit you with some trivia that I may have hit you with before. But the producer of at least one of those Third Eye Blind records is a guy named Jason Carmer, who also worked with the Donnas. He's from DC and he was the guitarist in 9353, which was a, a band that was like formative to me in my teenage 80s, like what is punk education? 9353 was a, a band that could sell out clubs in Washington DC and was completely unknown anywhere else. And in fact was existentially punished for leaving the Washington DC area when they played their one out of town show in, uh, the legendary CBGB show of 9353, their van broke down because they forgot to put oil in the transmission. The gods literally didn't allow them to leave their seat <laughs> of their highest power, which was Washington, D.C. But anyway, they made a huge impact on me, and they were not remotely a hardcore band. They were just a very weird art band with, I can't even describe them. How did you experience them first? They were a band that everybody would go see when I started hanging out with kind of punk rocky people 
they were all like, oh, 9353 is playing. But then once I saw them, I was like, we must see this band. I, I need to see them every time they play because they were so otherworldly to me, you know. But also they had a record and their record was really weird. And they had, you know, a video that was shot on video that was definitely done with like the super lowest production value and it got shown on Count Gore Duval's Saturday night horror movie show, you know, the dude who was like the sort of Count Floyd of the Baltimore, Washington area. He had a, you know, the Saturday night, like if they're showing like Lon Chaney movies, he would be like, and I've got something else for you kids. And it's really scary. It's a video by 9353. So, you know, it was all local legend kind of stuff. Wow. But, but that dude went on strangely enough the guitarist went on to to produce, among other things, to produce Third Eye Blind. I'm curious as to, uh, because I think you neatly elided the question, do you have an indefensible uh, artist slash hill? No, because I just stopped tr trying to, you know, I just am going to like, it's like that thing, you know, um, guilty pleasures. Like, I don't think there's such thing as a guilty pleasure. You just enjoy what you enjoy. I like loads of terrible stuff, <laughs> but you know. So you don't have a, you don't have a third eye blind in your um, pleasure closet, <laughs> Jay. <laughs> I try to put some adult content in. Here. Oh, there you go. That's good. You just took it up a notch. Um, <laughs> I thought we were supposed to talk about uh, what it was like to move from the indies to the majors in the 1990s. <laughs> Our, I know. I was. I was so excited to get into that because it really hasn't been talked about. It's true. It's a chapter that really gets passed over. So. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still, I, don't, I, can't think of my, I can't think of my worst guilty pleasure. Let me put it to you this way, Jay. What was the band that most made you want to throw your punk rock morals out the window and just sign up with the Atlantic group? Was it Sublime or was it 311? <laughs> yeah. I, or was it Mike Gitter? It was just, it was Mike Gitter all the way. You know, yeah. silver tongue devil I, that he is. <laughs> he let us Let us down the path. It's interesting to hear you talk about 9353. I would love for you to hear them because I think you'd hear why they just were like, you know, and there's a little bit of those undefinable bands like the Stranglers, right? You think you know what the Stranglers are like, but actually there's about six or seven different, completely different sounds associated with that band, but they're all identifiably that band kind of thing. So for 9353, it was like, like the men in black era Stranglers, the like real antisocial paranoia with a drum machine. You know, and then a little bit of Frank Zappa and a little bit of the Buzzcocks, a little bit of kind of towering goth hair and, you know, sort of theatricality. So a great band and, and willfully obscure to this day, you know, I mean, which I like. It made me think of that kind of the localities that we may have grown up in, you know, like that sounds like a real locality of like you had to have been there and seen what was happening and it reminded me of seeing i just accidentally saw the band green on red from la oh yeah we're kind of in that what was called the paisley underground you know we're associated with dream syndicate and maybe the long riders or just some of those great groups that happened when i was in high school and i remember seeing them at the at the lhasa club in la in hollywood which was very adult mm -hmm. like i was a kid but everyone there seemed like they were super adult right like know? real real sophisticated bohemian types yeah like like warhol factory types right and we were just like snotty teenagers but like being totally captivated by that band just because they were so idiosyncratically themselves and i don't know how i would feel about the music today i haven't heard them in a long time but i remember just being like so excited to have a new name to put on my list of like bands that i had seen and liked yes exactly and you know, they had a great light show, which is probably just a green bulb and a red bulb on the floor. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but it looked right. like crocodiles to me. I was like, whoa. I do really value that experience of being like, like for me, it was like being a teenager and feeling totally apart from the world that I was expected to go join, right? This is like before before encountering punk, right? Just being like, where am I going to go with this energy and this these interests that I have? Like, where do I fit? And then finding this thing that like 
there's so little precedent in your experience for it because you can't Google anything, you know, you can't do, it's like everything, it hit me with this incredible impact. And it is something like a light show that actually, if you went back and looked at it, it's just a red and a green light on the stage or whatever. But the fact that that first time you walk into this weird milieu and you're in a part of town you've never been, or you, you know, and you see people you, you couldn't imagine seeing and you're hearing this sound that you is just like, it's just enveloping, you know, that's, I'm so grateful for that, having had that experience and also having to scrounge and scour for weird records and just, you know, take a chance on something because the cover looks weird or you read an interview with Jello Biafra and he said the band was cool or whatever it was. And then you invest yourself in it. And maybe, maybe later on you're like, do I really like the subhumans? You know what I mean? But at the time, you're like, subhumans are the best. They're my band or whatever it is, you know? Part of it is, is just being young and like kind of new enough to be excited about things that you don't know. <laughs> you know, and you want, you want to cultivate that. Yeah. When I went to Denton, Texas for the first time, I felt like I could imagine kids in Denton having my high school experience, like at Rubber Gloves, that, yeah. that venue. I was like, this seems like the Lhasa Club to me. This is so fucking weird. And they're all totally at home here. And like, they, they own the space yeah. creatively. Yeah. So things like that, you know, make me think it's, yeah, I'm not a grouch. It's just, I'm just, I don't have many new experiences left <laughs> for me, this old guy. <laughs> so that is sad. I don't think that's true, actually. I don't actually think that's true. <laughs> but it's important to believe that that is not true. So one thing that I know Josh mentioned in the email was he was like, uh, maybe you guys could talk about how you became aware of each other's jaw bands. And I was thinking about it. And I think I don't have the chronology right in my mind. I remember buying the busy seven inch at vinyl Inc. Right. That's the one with Walter Matho on the cover. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember buying that at vinyl Inc. The same week that we were going to name our band and, and jawbreaker was on our short list of cool names. And then I saw that you had put out, I was, I was like, oh, there's already a Jawbreaker. I should buy this record. And then I listened to it and I was like, shit, and they're really great. Fuck, okay, well, we're not Jawbreaker then. <laughs> but Wow. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> My memory is of us playing together at DC Space. And I remember Kim, <laughs> Kim coming right out of the gate saying, we had our name, okay? <laughs> We knew what our name was as though like we had accused you of something. <laughs> We're like, we just think you're cool. You know? <laughs> but my memory, like everyone's is pretty faulty, but my, my memory of our first real contact was that show. Yeah. No, likewise. Totally. Like I remember you were wearing an orange Reese's peanut butter cup shirt, but to go back a little further, I mean, my, because I was like, and am a really die, die hard GI fan and had seen you play at Seabees on some mammoth bill with like verbal assault oh, and no dag nasty. Yeah, that makes, I mean, every bill at Seabees, every Seabees bill was a mammoth bill. <laughs> That's true. But for, for a fan, it was like, there was a lot of name recognition on stage that day. And it, it was, I think you guys were doing new material. Maybe it was pre-crash. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. That's probably, that sounds right for that bill that time. You know, might have been a CMJ show or something. All I can say, Jay, is it was sick. <laughs> you you have to understand that you for Bauermeister Fowler and I was that was our who's next. That's incredible. Like that, that is... like the total rock and roll record where you're like, wow, they are like everybody is flexing. That's so wonderful. But it's like, but it's not a showboat move, you know. It was just like it's just such a great rock and roll record. Man, oh, that warms my heart. I feel like GI's always felt like a band that had something to prove because we were like a little, we were kind of unhip in what we were very unhip in Washington, DC at a certain time. Why was that? Why, why was that? Cause there was that impression and I never, yeah, I think it was just not being from there. I didn't get it. Yeah. I think it's just part of it was like, you know, in DC, it was a real big thing to not to like, if somebody, if one person leaves the band, then the band's over. And there has to be another, you know, it, there'll be a new incarnation of something different, but it, you can't mess with the chemistry. It was like in a sort of unspoken 
rule, maybe, if you will. Like it just seemed like every band that that I loved in DC, they had this short and like volatile tenure and someone would peel off and then they the band would be like, fuck it, it's done. Instead of right. like the GI's model, which was Tom and John just kept that band together. And if you had a problem being in the band, well, thank you for your service. There will be someone else, you know? So, so it was when I joined GI's, it was almost like a joke that, uh, you know, who hasn't played bass in GI's yet? You know, I was the ninth bass player of government issue. So, <laughs> but longest tenured, because I was in the band for three and a half years. What was the first recorded thing you were on with GI? That was it. You was the first one. It was you? Yeah. Okay. Because you can hear a kind of melodic shift pre-you, I think, towards where... I always... I mean, it's easy to reverse engineer a band's direction. Yeah. But like that kind of 85 EP, or I feel like the record's right before it. Yeah, the one before you is great. That record's super good. Kind of has that clashy vibe to it, like a black market clash. Doesn't it start with like a weird like organ? And it's the going for broke record, right? Like they did all the records that were like, we have to finish this in a weekend. And then that was a record where they were like, no, let's just let's just freak out. So there's like sitar and organ and all sorts, you know, things that yeah. things that seem like a huge step out of their comfort zone. But also the songs on that record are so good. And I can say that because that's before I was in the band. So I can just be like, I can fan out about it. I think I assume you may have been associated with it because it, it, yeah, it alludes to the psychedelic element that was to come into, into full flower on you. And you know me, I'm Mr. Psychedelia. <laughs> you See, whether you know it or not, you are, man. <laughs> You are totally, I mean, you listen, that you look, you work those top three strings, spidery configurations, you know, jangle, it's all there. Wow. You can call it post-punk all you want, buddy, but it's psychedelic. <laughs> well, I call it learning <laughs> to play the bass by listening to Rites of Spring. That's what I call it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was alluding there to your top three strings on your guitar, like in Jawbox, in Burning Airlines, like you do a lot of... Uh, you know, Bacchanalian kind of a <laughs> Bacchanalian. You you play a lot on the on the higher strings, which yeah. to me is a kind of signature of, of psychedelic guitar work. Oh. Arpeggiated, you know. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. I don't know. It's because I can't play low. Can't play chords. Can't chunk. Is that true? I can't. I'm not a good chunker. Chunk, chunk, chunk. I can't downstroke at all. No. Someone told someone told me in in when I was at Forgetters, um, they said you have Jewish time, which is like klezmer or something because i kind of sweep up and down uh -huh. to do my chugga chuggas uh -huh. so it's like sh sh sugar 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 sh sh sugar 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 <laughs> they're like yeah that's totally like jewish time <laughs> like i play in threes or something like waltz those subtle klezmer rhythms that inform your work <laughs> you know? that's that's what my friends in the in the community tell me yes <laughs> well music should be a synthesis yeah so Wait, let's talk more about us. <laughs> <laughs> well, on your recommendation, I got ragtime on my Kindle, but I didn't I didn't start it yet. I started the first page, but I had to finish uh, uh -huh. I had to finish Ian Banks The Wasp Factory first. Oh, that guy's a maniac. Yeah, yeah. He's I could see you being into him. I, I was super into it. I've been trying to start the Wasp Factory for a long time, and then I finally read it on tour and I loved it up until the big reveal at the end where he made where he puts all the all of the pieces that have been so intriguing all come together at the end and i'm just like not having it i just really i was pretty down on it but it's so awesome such an awesome read up till that up till the big climactic reveal mm. but i don't know that i i took a um a great summer course in graduate school called british detective fiction uh -huh. which was mostly 20th and 21st century work kind of an ian rankin and um you know, Scottish, Irish, English police detective huh. procedurals. And Ian Banks' complicity was one of the books. I think I read that, but my brain's like an egg. So it's great. Like I get to go back and read it again and not realize that I've read it before. <laughs> Smooth as an egg. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, I would read anything. Like I think Ian Banks likes his style, you know, stylistically. He's just like, I'm there for it. But and his unpleasant characters that are also somehow empathetic, but like, yeah, yeah. it's like Martin Amos that way too, right? Like Martin Amos is like his characters are always kind of loathsome, but you're you're on their team anyway. I wonder sometimes, like, are we being asked too often to understand complicated men? <laughs> in like, 
you know what I mean? It's such a popular kind of trope yeah. these days. And certainly in like prestige television, it's like, wow, look how you know deeply conflicted all these men are. Like it makes sense that they're such total assholes in real life. That's really true. Like, yeah, I, like the anti-hero thing has sort of <laughs> moved over into a realm of like, I fucking hate this guy. <laughs> Why am I following this jerk? I think obviously it was like, it was once a really noble pursuit. Like let's understand bad behavior. But it, it's, and I'm not saying that it's valorized necessarily, but they still seem like these central figures in our stories. And it's like, we also seem to be at the same time, we've achieved this consensus that like, as long as people are just really fucked up, you need to get away from them. You know what I mean? And I kind of wonder like why we're still so fascinated by, or they tell us we're fascinated and keep serving us these stories of like deeply complicated men. I mean, that's a deep subject, right? Did you see the Joel Cohen Macbeth? Oh, I haven't. No. It's super good. If you think about it, like, you know, that's, I mean, it goes, doesn't it go back that far? Absolutely. Yeah. Right. But I mean, we're all, we're like up to our eyeballs in it now, everywhere you look, almost as if it's like, in order to prove that as an, it, it's like, this isn't just entertainment, you know, we're taking on some deep shit here kind of thing. That's what I often think when I'm, when I see like the, the sheer like proliferation of complicated and unlikable protagonists, you know, and then sometimes they're just great, you know? So I'm not quite sure what I was going for, but I, I think there is this, I sense this gulf between in Shakespeare and up until the fifties, it was somewhat transgressive because they were criticizing actual culture. And now it seems like they're almost one and the same, you know, like this kind of branded behavior of there's something like there's some repatriation going on in our culture. To me, it feels like the early 90s when like Details was a magazine. Right. You know, met, there's this real like masculinity that's that's like we're a really conservative culture all of a sudden. Yes. Yeah. First they were stealing punk rock and now it's like it's just utterly gone to me. That's when I, I looked up from my my own life and was like, you know, everyone was passing as like underground and alternative. And now they're just like these guys wear like, you know, fancy watches and like trimmed beards and it's suddenly like this real masculinity is kind of present which i'm i don't quite understand i gotta chew on that a little bit because i think i i think i see what you're saying too but i also thought like it, along the same lines i um was i watching severance which i thought was a, a, is a really good show i'm only a couple episodes into it but it occurred to me that we're surrounded by these really trenchant critiques of cyber culture like and and sort of corporate feudalism that's happening all around us and it's being served to us by corporate media so i'm with the message of this show and i know that it's really smart and really clever and i'm enjoying it but i'm a little bit like you know I, I, it's yeah i mean i don't know where to go with it yeah the avenues no you're like you're you're a little bit like oh good to meet you Right. Well, yeah, I got right. It's like, like, it's like man who is presenting me this narrative critique of what you actually do yourself. Right. Yeah. You could just go in circles and, and it gets us back to our, you know, major label sellout thing, too. It's just like, well, it's better to make the art and say the thing that you need to say. And for better or worse, like the, the, the venues for doing it that that aren't somehow mediated by multinational corporations seem to be dwindling and dwindling as far as like trying to have an impact on anybody except for like one-on-one -on -one impact. I, I'm not expressing it very well, but I think hopefully you know what I'm saying. It's, and a, but I think that's where we are in our discourse in a really painful way. It's like it, all of this stuff, and I've heard other academics say it, it's like, it's so hard to think through because everything is so hyper-mediated by forces that we have a lot of ambivalence about. We maybe don't want to be in bed with, so to speak. Um, we're also taking a great deal of content from them and value some of the, you know, the piecework that's done under their auspices. Yeah. Some great, great writers and musicians are toiling away and, and actually making really cogent work. But it's like all of this shit is so fucking hard to think through. Right. And part of the difficulty, I think, is this kind of meta state we're finding ourselves in where like the vendor is the evil empire right. that he's that his product is critiquing. Right. Exactly. You know, well like. Like, uh, yeah, like fucking Gasatanka Records is putting out a flipper record. And you're like, what the fuck, dude? <laughs> All right, maybe I went a little too far on that. <laughs> I, had it, I had it before. I, <laughs> I hit the third rail and went, went reserved. Yeah. 
that's 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 pretty much what i'm saying it was like it's weird i was like well then then i could choose to be cynical about it but i would prefer not to because like in the case of of severance i just think it's great i'm looking forward to that one but you know but then i'm gonna i'm gonna say it's on apple tv and then it's just it's all like all the things that sort of resonate off of that or you know but you know i mean i felt i felt a weird feeling also i was so the other night just to shift gears in a way that might only be related in my brain but like i was so happy that we got to play those shows with you guys i'll just tell you since we're face to face more or less like so so happy on so many levels the first show in seattle i was like i was so discombobulated about sharing a space with that many people you know, I really felt like uh, not like it, it felt great to play. It felt great to be there. But I just had this uh, visceral feeling of of terror of getting within like five feet of anybody and like a total uncertainty. And over the course of the week, I was pleased that that melted away. And then I started just really appreciating. I was like, everybody who's in this space right now could really use a catharsis you know, including, and especially me, like, and, and it was so awesome. Cause I also was, I also found myself thinking like, you know, I, I was think of like playing in a band or making music a little bit as an act of protest. Like when Trump was president, I could get on stage and I could be like, you know what, whatever I'm doing right now is in direct opposition to the powers that be. It doesn't matter what I'm like, whatever, whatever I can do right now, let me be sure that at least mentally and spiritually, it's a big fuck you to Donald Trump and everybody around him and the sort of direction of this culture, blah, 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 right? So I could s sort of know what I was opposed to and kind of derive some energy from this thing. And now I'm like, the things that are huge and out of control are beyond, you know, and like threatening are beyond my control. And so I can't have the same motivation because I'm just like, oh, if we're gonna live through World War III, I'm not sure what I can do. And it's ridiculous to sort of put myself in that context as a, someone who's just about to sing a song. But as someone who just has spent a couple of years longing for some kind of human connection outside my bubble and wanting to like get out and do something positive and be around other people who are creative and who I, who I like and like feel that good energy of it. I just think you got, I think it was like, a really beautiful experience so i cannot thank you enough for for letting us be a part of that because it was great i feel the same way it was a real crash course in like reassimilation into the human chain yeah you know like i had the same ambivalence you did i know everyone in jawbreaker was like how the hell are we going to be around crowded unmasked rooms after we've been insulated for two years and it was, I realized very quickly, like, you know what, it's, you just rip it off and like the bandaid has to just get torn off yeah. abruptly or slowly. And this, it happens to be by necessity now, it's just going to happen every night and you can fight it or like go with it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I got over it a little quicker that way. I mean, having good people we knew and good company, everyone playing their fucking heart out, you know, and then just the energy of people in those rooms was, yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah. It's uh, talk to me in two weeks, you know, maybe I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're lucky you got out when you did. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm liking the physicality of it for sure. Like we've all been so paralyzed, this kind of hyper passivity that is partly Trump induced mm -hmm. and then partly pandemic and like they've hijacked the truth, but also like we've been truthfully locked down for our own health. And so everything, everything feels passive in our society, you know, we just, we just receive news, whether we hate it, disbelieve it or like it, but to be physically like hurting my 54 year old hip. Yeah. Doing a, doing a wicked like guitar move. Right. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was great. I was like, I want to bleed. man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Being embodied, I, embodied would be the word, right? We were like in our bodies. Yes. Just like, yeah. Feeling it. Yeah. It's amazing definitely better than like pilates in the park with these affinity teams i have we have going in brooklyn you know jerks you've been doing a lot of pilates <laughs> in the park is that 
<laughs> well, you know, like everyone, everyone's in business all the time. Yeah. Like that's this is how I feel is in New York. Like everyone's just running their business through the pandemic. So like all the personal trainers are like, yeah, we'll just do it on the street, you know, get base camp, right. like right in front of my apartment building. And there'll be like 14 fucking mid twenties people like with their asses up in the air. And I'm like, Hey, I don't want to see that man. <laughs> Hell out of here with your fucking business. <laughs> Jay, are you recording today? Are you working? A little bit, but it's, I got just, uh, I had to run some instrumental mixes for somebody and do some tweaks on something else. I'm very, I'm very excited. Actually, I got to mix. There's this, uh, do you remember Tar? Remember the band Tar? Yeah. You guys did a, a split with them, right? Yes. And they, their singer and drummer are in a new band called Deep Tunnel Project. And they sent me a couple songs to mix. So I have to do tweaks on their mixes for now. It's very exciting. Well, we just ran into the band's surfboard in the parking lot of the Phoenix Hotel. Oh, yeah. And they were like, Jawbreaker. And I was like, yeah, I don't know who you are, but they, they <laughs> seem really cool. <laughs> yeah. No, they're very, they're, they're a feast for the eyes. They're a very colorful yeah. band. Oh, my God. I was like, who is this band? Like, this is a band. Yeah. Are you, what else are you do? What are you like? I mean, you're just taking midnight walks in San Francisco. Is that the vibe? I have been walking out to the uh, Ghirardelli coastline every morning like five <laughs> the Ghirardelli and then I, 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 I rolled by the yeah Ghirardelli I was thinking about four inmates <laughs> the Alcatrazians you know sniffing the chocolate through their bars <laughs> as the as the apocryphal tale goes how cruel that insult to injury but, yeah that's it that's awesome thanks again safe travels Blake thanks Jay you too Thanks for listening to the TalkHouse podcast, and thanks to Jay Robbins and Blake Schwarzenbach for chatting. If you like what you heard, please follow TalkHouse wherever podcasts are sold. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan, and the TalkHouse theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.